It's very lonely being the CEO. No one cares about you. They don't. Philip Mountford, CEO, chairman, and NED, with a legacy at fashion giants like Honkamola, Mossbros, and Versace. Dive deep into the mind of a top CEO to show you how to become a transformational leader yourself. I started at 17 years old. I was called a management trainee. At the end, I was the managing director. Leaders are born, managers are made. I didn't realize how ruthless I'd be. You don't get to become a CEO unless you work hard. The most important thing I wanted was for people to be surprised and shocked. When they're not, then you know you stay too long. What is the hardest part about being a CEO? Welcome back to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. You did it. You got the show to 1,000 subscribers. And if you're a regular and you haven't subscribed yet, hit that subscribe button. Let's get to 2,000 subscribers. And I promise you, I'll get even more amazing guests. Let's do it. Philip, welcome to Anatomy of a Leader. Good to see you. And you too, really good. <laughs> Bright and early. Yes, yeah, and rainy London, and rainy London. Yes, yeah, so really good to have you on the show. Thank I mean, you. We've known each other for... A long time. Exceptionally yeah. long time. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah, nice to see you. Thank well, you. let's get straight to the point. What does leadership mean to you? Well, I think, you know, I, I, I've done a, um, a speeches in a lot of universities. I, as you know, I was a runner when I was younger. And uh, I did a, so I do a speech which is uh, always uh, provokes things, which is basically leaders are born, managers are made. Um, and I, I don't mean managers. I mean that the way that uh, some CEOs manage businesses where there are natural born leaders and then there are just very structured uh, managers, each person can lead a company in a different way but you see one as a sort of natural and I always use uh, Richard Branson you know he is an incredible leader um, uh, but actually not a very good operator so you know with, with his amazing uh, leadership skills his vision his passion uh, he then needs people behind him to deliver on the operations and then I always use and I study him uh, so, so Terry Leahy who is really one of the most structured disciplined focused, strategic uh, CEOs that have come across very different people. Um, and then if you look around him, he employed very um, charismatic people around him. So it is about, you know, what is leadership? I think leadership is really setting f clear goals for the, for the business. And, uh, you know, they've all moved on over the decades in terms of, you know, we started off with mission and it was mission and vision. Uh, and now the most important thing is purpose. Um, so we, you know, really every brand really needs a purpose. It needs to be able to say, um, there's a reason for us to belong. And then that the CEO needs to be able to, um, in effect, work with the team to create a clearly defined vision and a clearly defined mission and a, and a really structured strategic plan so that everybody can understand what everybody needs to deliver to deliver a successful business, you know, and within that, you know, leadership is a key element to it all. This episode is sponsored by HVO Search, a specialist executive search and talent advisory firm helping founders, CEOs and HR directors hire the most in-demand and best C-suite talent. Tired of seeing the same old CVs and uninspiring candidates? Reach out to me, Maria Vorostovsky, to find out how your business can skyrocket with the best talent. Hmm. What was your path to leadership? I mean, you're currently the CEO of Honkamola, <coughs> previously CEO of Dax, mm. MD at Versace, yep. MD at Nautica. Nautica. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And um, CEO of Moss Bros as well, uh, and chairman of Needle and Thread. Um, and uh, as you know, I sit on a number of other boards uh, uh, around the world uh, Taco, um, and uh, Dorina, Scandell, and 68. Um, quite a lot of those based in Hong Kong and Shanghai. Um, and, you know, I work in a, in a lot of different countries and through my um, whole career, I've moved. You know, I've lived in Milan, uh, I've lived in Osaka, I've lived in Hong Kong, um, I've lived in New York. Um, every country has its nuances. Um, and I don't think you can have one standard um, way of acting, both in terms of leadership um, and in terms of the way you conduct yourselves in in certain countries, you know, China and uh, and uh, and Japan and Hong Kong, very different to Italy, where where you know really passion counts. Really, pa you know, your employees want to see 
real passion. Uh, and, and in the uh, uh, the Far East, certainly when I was there, it was a long time ago, it was much more structured and you need to become a little bit of a chameleon to make sure that uh, your management style or leadership style fits the environment that you're in. You know, I always laugh. I thought that um, Holland would be the easiest uh, environment, certainly after working in Italy and, and America. How come? Why did you think it would well, be? Well, I mean, easy? basically, in, I, I, you know, I went there for a number of interviews. It was At that point, it was part of the Max Seder Group. Um, uh, Tony Denuncio, who I think is really one of the best retailers, the ex-CEO of Asda, was the executive chairman of this business. Everybody I met was was either English or they could speak incredibly fluent English. Um, and really, at the end of the day, we're talking about a country that's less than 100 miles away, let's be clear. Um, but culturally, it's humongously different. I mean, really humongously different. I really underestimated the difference in culture. Mm. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, to be a good leader, you need to adapt quickly. I I, I think I took longer to adapt in uh, in Amsterdam than I should have done. I, I think you know, we were there to turn a business around. It was a um, really was a turnaround case. So decisions needed to be made um, extremely quickly in a culture which is called polder dock. It's basically a debate culture where people have the right to challenge. Uh, and I truly mean that the cleaner could come to my office and tell me I was doing something wrong, uh, which, which yeah, you know, okay, it may happen in the UK today, but it didn't happen 15 years ago. Um, so, you know, you have to learn and you have to develop. Um, and, you know, I run a business that basically has an average age of less than 25. It's a very different way of managing a more classic business like Moss Pros, where, you know, the consumer is older, the employee is older, and you have to develop. As a, as a person, you need to develop. There's not one way of conducting yourself um, if you want to succeed. The Dutch culture is immensely, it's a frugal culture. If you think Scotland is frugal, then then uh, Holland uh, surpasses it about 10 times over. Um, wealth is not shown. Um, billionaires ride bicycles. Um, and everybody has the right to an opinion. Um, uh to be honest today, I love it. I, I really, truly love it. Um, I think you get really open and transparent feedback, far more open than you would get in an Anglo-Saxon uh, environment uh, because the whole infrastructure is set up for the ability to um, discuss, um, openly discuss. Mm. You know? And you know, I think also, again, for me, it, it was a very difficult... Um, for an Anglo-Saxon where it, it, we're coming in and we are driving change. And, you know, sometimes um, you try to bring your team with you. I mean, there's, there really are two different types. I mean, nearly most of the things I've done has been uh, basically turnarounds. Um, and basically when you go in, you either, you find your team and you work and develop them. And then sometimes you just don't have the time. And with Hunker Bono when, when we joined, we didn't have the time. So it, it, unfortunately it was a, a clearing out of all the senior management we took out. Basically, um, the top 38 people, only two survived. So um, was it the right thing to do? Or the wrong, In hindsight, it was the right thing to do. It was very, the business took a long time uh, to recover from it, I have to be honest with you. How long? Um, I, I would say three or four years. Uh, the stigma of the, the brutalness uh, just stayed. It, the stigma internally with the team? <coughs> yeah, or only internally. No, no, because externally, no, nobody saw it. No, th this is very much internal... Um, the, the good thing about um, a living in Amsterdam is that you um, can conduct yourself in a much more civilised way. You don't have the UK press. So uh, you can get on and you can run your business in a, uh, an environment that allows you to make decisions that you need to make. Mm. Where in the UK, nearly everything is washed in public. Um, so most of your decisions are discussed on the tube. Yeah, because somebody else has got an opinion of what you should have done in your business. And, you know, in Central Europe, that doesn't happen so often. Mm. It's quite interesting because you've got this contrast of being open, discussing it in the here and now about the things that bother you, but not publicly. I mean, I, I, let, let, let's talk about Marks and Spencers. Um, I mean, that's a, that is a business that is loved and hated. At the moment, it's truly loved, but lots of times it, it, it's also not loved. And everybody has an opinion on it. Everybody has an opinion on it. My mother has an opinion on it. Everybody has an opinion on it. It doesn't mean it's right. It's just their own personal opinion that they went into a store 
and they couldn't find the sausages they want. So therefore, there's a, a, um, a basically a distribution issue, okay? Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, you know, these businesses employ highly professional people. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, nobody goes to work to do a bad job, you know? Um, you know, sometimes we make mistakes, and I think, you know, um, we're in a culture in, in, in Central Europe uh, in, in Amsterdam, the rest of Central Europe, it very, very much differs. If I look at my German office to my Dutch office, where um, the UK, you cannot be seen to be to make mistakes. Okay, that's the Anglo-Saxon, um, basically, heritage. Um, uh, success is everything. Uh, finance is everything, uh, um, uh, etc. And in, in Holland, there is no keeping up with the Joneses. It doesn't exist. Um uh, it's a, it's a, just a different culture. Mm. Yeah. I'm going to come back on the not being afraid of making mm. mistakes, but I want to go back to the moment. So you're talking about, you know, really clearing out the team, mm. making very significant changes, difficult moment. Talk me through how you felt and how you handled that at the time. Yeah, um, at, at, the, at the time, it was, for me, very easy. I could just see that this business was just failing. The, ma the management, the downside of the open debate is sometimes things don't get done. That's the, so if you look at, you know, um, I think if, if I had carried on with the Dutch culture at that time, Hunkerman would have been bankrupt. We're nearly 850 million today, throwing off, you know, and, um, uh, more than 15% uh, EBIT data net sales. So it's a super pro professional company. I think they were spending too much time debating at some point somebody needed to make decisions and move on um and you know every business needs a, a, a different person at a different time you know and i was i was right at that time i didn't realize how ruthless i'd been until people talked to you about it afterwards and how they they experienced they all look back and go if you hadn't have done it philip we wouldn't be here but still, for them, this was a very big decision, and, you know, and a decision that, of course, they weren't involved in. It was very much um, suddenly this Anglo-Saxon turns up uh, in in this ladies' underwear business, which had an average age. Our customer was also forty-five. Our employee was forty-five, and our our, uh, our customer was forty-five. And what we did was, we turned a business that basically was um, Marks and Spencer's underwear in a white box into a beautiful brand. And most CEOs that try to do those things fail. Uh, and I was talking to somebody literally last night, and they said, sorry, for it. you know, what, what... There are more cases when people do this and try to change the average uh, age of a consumer by 20 years, fail. Um, I'd love to tell you that I know the why and how we did it. We, we, we had some lucky sliding doors. We selected an incredible brand ambassador, uh, a lady called Sylvie van der Vaart, um, who uh, was married to Rafael van der Vaart, that was one of the most famous football players. And uh, he played football in Spain, he played football in the UK, in, of course, in Holland, but also in, in, in Germany. And her presence really um, uh, lifted our whole brand equity. If you look at it today, I was also surprised that she said yes to do this. Um, and it really was a partnership. She didn't take a huge fee. She took a share of the upside. So actually, we, it de-risked all, all the things. And it really took our whole brand from this very classic, commercial, um, beautifully made product, but, but nothing that you really want was yummy. And we turned it into a brand that basically is predominantly, our customers between 15 and, and 30. Um, so we really did some great things. We've had, uh, it's been, it's been, and I really have fallen in love with the brand. I, 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 as you know, I did a video uh, when I announced I was leaving. Um, it, it's really difficult. And some days I really regret, did I make the right decision? And the, and I really made the right decision. I mean, at the end of the day, um, every time I've left the business, I it's been for the right reason. And, you know, this time it was, it was the right reason. I, I, I really felt like I want to go out still being Christian Ronaldo, okay? And I'm talking about Christian Ronaldo playing for uh, Real Madrid, not, not Saudi Arabia. Um, and I want to be remembered. And somebody said, you know, what did you want? And I said, the most important thing I wanted was for people to be surprised and shocked. Um, when they're not, then you know you stay too long. Mm. Um, but I've always said all the way through, I've always done every conference I said, you know, um, I don't own this brand. Um, 
I, I'm a relay player. And at some point, you know, you pass the baton over. Um, normally, if you look at my career, it was predominantly five years, which is already quite long for a CEO. Um, but, you know, this was 15 and it was 15 amazing years. And, and it's it's literally when I go on January 31st, it's 15 years to the day. Uh, and that's why I picked it. Uh, and it just, it was the perfect moment, perfect storm, perfect time to go. And, it, and it's the perfect time to basically pass this brand over to somebody that is going to take it to the uh, the next stages. Mm. So do you think you mentioned five years mm. that it's too long for a CEO? But if you look at, if you look at most retail CEOs, outside family businesses, five years is probably the longest that any CEO gets. Mm. Okay, But there's a difference between how long they get and what's the optimum amount of time of being in a brand. Yeah, I, I mean, um, uh, three is too short, uh, 10 is too long. So is it five or is it seven? But if you look at most um, CEOs in fashion, you get five, mm. unless you've done something that is um, so colossal um uh, but really you know that, that that's unfortunately how the um uh, uk and the us is driven by you know it is success after success after success you never get the ability to have a correction year and that's just you know how these countries are structured mm. so the five years is within five years you need to significantly improve the value of yeah. the business sell it grow it yeah and achieve that within that time frame. Yeah, I mean, you know, Hunker Muller, you know, it, um, we've sold it four times. It's had four separate owners. It was Max Ada, then it was KKR, then we sold it from KKR into the French private equity PAI, uh, then we sold it into Carlisle, and then Carlisle, we sold it into um, Parkcom, which is a um, Dutch private equity. Mm -hmm. So um, you, you, know, you have to build brand equity, um, you, you have to pay down debt, um, and you have to increase the EBITDA valuation. So you have to do, and of course, <laughs> you have to produce EBITDA. Um, so, you know, we've sold this four times for more money than, than the time before. So we've really seen four escalating uh, valuations of the business. Um, it's been, it's just been great. And I, I can literally walk away from this and be super proud. You know, mm -hmm. not, this isn't Philip Mount, but this is, this is an amazing team of people that did this, you know. Um, and we really have some incredible people in our team that really helped to sculpt, you know, the, the product, uh, the digital, you know, really have. So we've been super lucky. And really for my first 12 years, I had the best CFO that any CEO could ever, ever, ever had. He really was my number two. His name was Ron Hemmer. And um, he was, we, we literally uh, were truly aligned. And he literally could say, Philip, we shouldn't do this. And and he was the one person that, that I, I could really, if he said, Philip, we really shouldn't do this, I knew we shouldn't do it. So... It's not just about one person. It really is having a team of people with, with different skills, you know, uh, that balance a team to make sure that you really deliver, you know, success. Uh, On this note, so you're saying he's the best CFO that you've worked with, apart from being very direct and saying we shouldn't do it. What else makes him great? Yeah, I, I'll tell you what makes him great, you know, because again, uh, he's won um, uh, the Dutch uh, CFO of the year twice and the German one uh, what, at least once. Um, and basically he had the ability to um, spend money wisely. So um, most of our time we didn't save money we spent it to generate more valuation of the business. And, you know, lots of CFOs control cash. Um, and what they don't do is they don't look at um, creating value. And Ron, Ron really had the ability to say, Philip, if we spend this, we will create more value. You know, and, you know, th that's, that's quite a unique skill. You know, not all CFOs ha have that skill. And not and every business needs you know our business we needed that I needed that and we just worked so well together we both had a vision of how we could grow the business and you know I didn't have to worry about that bit um, but you know he was never there saying Philip we need to save costs he was always sitting there saying how can I find more cash to open more stores? Okay, the world has changed. It's not always about stores, but at the beginning, you know, stores were really uh, uh, a vital part of our business. When I joined, we had 300. We have more than 900 stores today. 
Uh, we did have over um, a thousand stores. The world was changing. There's a, a, a regroup. But, you know, he found money so that we could invest to make sure that we could actually add more value to the business and the brand. You know, and I think it's a very unique skill. And, you know, we talk about, you know, it's not just about leadership from me. You know, he was a leader. My digital director is a leader. My, my CPO, she's a leader. I mean, they're real leaders. So it is about surrounding yourself with great people. What do you look for? In most cases, um, I, I look for people that compliment me. Um, uh, I really do. Um, so uh, you still need to work together. You need to walk away from that interview going, I, I, I can spend 12 hours a day, five days a week with this person. You really have. Um, um, they don't always have to tell you what you want to hear. Um, we, we try and always employ people that are better than the job. Um, you know, and we're private. What do you too. mean by that? I mean, we always, uh, we always really try to find people that are going to really add value to us, stretch us, take us out of our, our comfort zones. Um, uh, you know, Charlotte Davis was one of those. You know, came from Marks and Spencers, uh, really pushed our boundaries. Um, Heist Van England, who's my digital director, uh, came from uh, came from Dell. It was not an obvious um, uh, um, transfer for him because basically he, he was selling computers and we were selling ladies' underwear. But his understanding of um, the, the technical side. But having the ability to drive, so it's quite unique. So he's super technical, really technical. So he can really have a really strong opinion on tooling, on Google, um, etc. But equally, uh, he worked for Dell, which is predominantly an American company. So very, very KPI driven. So normally your digital director is one or the other, not both. Mm -hmm. So you know we 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 have been lucky. I I had one, uh, not one. I had the best marketing director, uh, Adriana Hoppenbrauer. Uh, she came from Nike. Um, and um, she pushed me always further than I ever wanted to go. You know, if I wanted to go to 100, she would take me to 150 uh, and then come back to 120. She, she'd get 20% more than, than I was prepared to, uh, to give up type thing. And she really took us from, you know, somebody said to me, Philip, you, you created a great brand. I said, no, no, I didn't. I had, I had one woman, Adriana, who said, Philip, we need to, this is what I believe this retailer needs to do. Uh, and, you know, let's work together to do it. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't just my idea. You know, when I joined, I wrote on my wall on day one, uh, from a high street retailer to a high street brand. Okay. Um, and, you know, and that slogan changed over years. So we went from a high street brand to a global brand to a... Um, inclusive uh, um, and global brand, and then it ended up being a much loved, uh, inclusive and social brand. Um, and why much loved? Again, that came from my HR director or my CRO, uh, Anna Yaka, who said, "Philip, life is all about uh, falling in love." Okay, um, we are a brand that is sensitive. It's ladies' underwear, it's super sensitive. You, you, if you look at what happened to Victoria's Secret and other brands like AP, um, the minute you cross the borders, it takes a long time to come back. And she said, We need our staff and we need our customers to fall in love with us. So, in all, all relationships, when you're in love with somebody, you can make, make a mistake and people still love you. So, and I really thought, you know, you're just so right. We need to really build a brand that people truly love. And, and with Ladies Intimate Apparel, you, you, at some point you're going to take a picture that offends somebody. It's, it's so uh, personal to people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we then started to really build about the importance of everybody falling in love with the brand. Again, that was our, my um, HR director, Anna Yaka. So, um, you know, everybody's contributed to the, the success of the business. Why did Hunker Muller succeed and Victoria's Secret didn't? Well, it's not true. You, it, really, you've got to be very careful. I mean, a Victoria's Secret is still a 6.8 billion turnover business, throwing off nearly 800 million. Um, okay, it, 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 it has slipped. Um, and Martin Walters, who runs it, is, is a close friend of mine. Um they were too late to, to go into inclusion and diversity, and they've been criticised for doing it for the wrong reason. Um, uh, we were always a more inclusive brand. Um, don't get me wrong, we turned up the volume when, when we, we could see the early signs of VS, which was about eight or nine years ago. 
we were lucky that the US always gets hit first by these things. So by the time it hit Europe, we were already well positioned in terms of our whole inclusion and diversity strategy, not just for our models, but internally with our staff in our stores and our head office. So you know we, we saw it happening, but we were quicker to move. Um, and, and VS were... You know, they had this magic formula. People forget they had this magic formula. Um, People and loved it at the time. I they, mean, and was... they still love it because it's still 6.8 billion turnover. And it's still the number one brand in, in, in the US. Um you know, it's very easy to criticise. I'm sure there will be people sitting outside also saying, um, Uncle Miller could have done things better. So you, let's all be careful. Um, they, they, For me, they were just too slow to to react. I think they thought the, the wave would go past them and it didn't. It crashed into them. Um, uh, and then they weren't quick to react uh, to it. Um, and then they, they really had some, you know, their uh, creative director said some inappropriate things to a journalist i mean you know it couldn't have got you know it was a, it's like a snowball you know the ball started rolling and then yeah, it all it all got caught up so you know we were we were quick to sense that the market was moving we were quick to sense that actually you cannot be this perfect underwear brand it's such a critical uh, garment people have really again have personal um uh, opinions of what good looks like um and we were quick to move our our image, both photography-wise and our culture. Mm. Going back to what you were talking about, risk-taking and how this fear of mm. failure, of making mistakes in the UK in particular, is mm. really holding businesses, people back. <clears throat> What's your approach to failure? Yeah, I think it, it, it's very different. I've come through, um, you know, I'm 58, I, and I've come through a time uh, where I think we were not so heavily uh, um, assessed by the public. Scrutinised. Scrutinised. I was trying to find the right word for it. Um, uh, I, you know, I got heavily scrutinised at, at Moss Bros. It was a, a very um, uncomfortable and uh, ugly um, uh, period of time. You know, F- Philip Green uh, bought a big share of it. Kevin Stamford had previously owned All Saints and Karen Millen had a share of it. There, there you had the Moss and the G families who basically glued a business together uh, to float as a, a, a publicly listed company. Um, with no alignment between the businesses. And, you know, I came in to run it um, as a 35-year-old CEO. Um, and, you know, it was a tough gig. And I took some very brave decisions. We had 15 sub-brands and we made one into, into Moss. And we took the, it took it from a huge loss to a profit. And then the year I went, it started to fall, which was 2008. Basically, the, the year where basically the world sort of crashed. Um, and it was a painful time. So through the uh, uh, the six years, I had five and a half amazing years. I probably put my head above the parapet too often. Uh, my my face was on the front of too many magazines. And then when it went wrong, it was also on the front of too many magazines, but this time for the wrong reason. Uh, I know a lot of CEOs don't want to come on the show. Mm. And many don't even want to seek that public scrutiny or being Mm. you know visible what's your view on that or i guess maybe what's your advice to ceos about being visible versus being more behind the scenes yeah i mean for the last 15 years i've spent most of my time behind the scenes there are hardly any um articles on me um and this is deliberate yeah it was very deliberate after the period of time with boss boss and i was young and i was ambitious and um i i i loved the the attention and then uh, when it goes wrong you suddenly don't love the attention so at the time do you think you did it for attention um i i I think you know when you see yourself continually in newspapers uh my father ran a a footsie uh, company Okay. And he would laugh and said, uh, "Philip, I, I ran a business in the billions, and I can I, I can show you the columns that I had versus the front pages that you had." He said, "You know, it shows you the difference between uh, no one was really interested in electrical engineering. It's not very sexy, super profitable, and then everybody has an opinion about product. And uh, you know, I, I've got a, a lovely bag uh, full of, of clippings of the Times, the Telegraph, etc." Uh, but I always tell a great story. My uh, my best friend, Tom Hallett, um, uh, was at the Standard and the Daily Mail. Um, and for years they did, in, 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 in there, they did a Hero and Zero. 
And I think I had hero four or five times. Uh, and when I got the zero, um, which was about the last uh, six months at Mossbros, um, he had it blown up uh, six foot on hardboard and sent to my house. Um, so um, he's still my best friend. We've been best friends since we were 12. But it's a good reminder that basically uh, be careful what you wish for. Okay. So when that happened, how did you feel? No, I think for any CEO, these sort of things, there's one thing that, you know, at that point, it was also the world. 2008 was not, was, was you know, looking back, it was a horrible time. But at the at the end of the day, you are scrutinised by the public. Um, and to be honest with you, I put my head above the parapet, so I deserved to equally get um, the uh, same amount of column inches for when it went wrong, for when it went right. So... I think it was a huge learning curve for me to make sure that um, make sure your team get more um, column inches than you do. Hmm. Yeah. What was Philip Green like to work with? Um, I always tell a fantastic story. I mean, uh, we were at uh, Draper's Record and he walked across, he'd, he wrote his name on a, a, um, a dinner card and he slapped it into my hand and said, Mountford, I won't use the word he used, there was another word in between, ring me. Um, and anyway. Uh, so that set the tone. That set the tone. Anyway, I think it was the next day or a day afterwards I rang him and he, he was trying to um, get me to run one of his businesses. And then there was an article that James Hall in the uh, um, Telegraph wrote, basically um, uh, full spike, um, uh, Philip Green basically saying, if Philip doesn't come and work for me, then I'm going to buy Moss Bros. Yeah, about three years later, I had a phone call and I thought it was a spoof, to be honest with you. I thought it was one of my friends. Um, so a lady rang and said, I have Sir Philip on the phone. And I was just about to say something quite rude. Uh, and then he has such a recognisable voice, I suddenly realised it really was uh, Sir Philip Green. Um, and, you know, it, it, his philosophy at the time, and I won't go into it because it, it, never, it never came to fruition, would have been a great thing to do, Okay. Um, and then he got a very good offer from Simon Berwin, um, who was our biggest supplier, um, uh, to basically sell his shares in a very short period of time. So he bought the shares from Balger and Kevin Stanford, um, and then he sold it uh, in a quite short period of time onto uh, Simon Berwin, and, and that was the time for me to go. It was perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, uh, you know, somebody said to me, Philip, would you write a book? And the answer is no. Um, uh, um, I've got some fantastic stories which I'm very happy to tell uh, in bars but I, I don't want it uh, uh, in writing but I've, you know we've lived uh, a fantastic retail life you know um, yeah, you know, I did Simpson Piccadilly and I'm really proud I started at 17 years old I was called a management trainee but basically I, I stacked I stacked trousers in, in shelves and uh, at the end I was the managing director of a Simpson Piccadilly Simpson Big Dilly, and we sold it. We tried to sell it as a going concern. I still believe it was the most beautiful uh, clothing store there was. Um, we couldn't sell it, and we sold it as a property acquisition uh, to um, uh, to Waterstone and then to um, the Scottish Widows. So that was my first transaction. I was only 29 years old. Then I went out to Osaka and on to Hong Kong and then out to the US. So, you know, uh, you know, I, you know, did I intend to come into retail? Absolutely not. Um, I was a... Um, uh, semi-professional runner um, my whole ambition was to go to the Olympics um, I was in the uh, top tier of the UK in terms of 800 meters um, so I just expected myself to be an athlete uh, then I fell off a motorbike um, and um, this was um, uh, and it, this seemed a natural thing to do and then I just fell in love with the clothing industry. I really fell in love with it. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody said to me, would you do something else? The only time I've done something different is I'm also, uh, was the deputy chairman of a beautiful um, a furniture brand called Riviera Maison, which I also loved. But still, it's it's to do with lifestyle. Um, and, you know, I'm a simple person. Um, you know, somebody said to me, what do you do? I buy and sell clothes to make a profit. When you were stacking trousers onto the shelves, did you have ambitions to become a CEO one day? Um, no. I, I, again, another great story. So I think it was about week three. We, all the trainee managers were taken up to the uh, HR department and they sat everybody around the table. Um, and still two of them I'm very close friends with. 
Um, uh, so there was myself, a guy called James Perring, and then basically, I think, 20 um, uh, women. And they got, went around the room, and it shows you how uneducated. So we, I was 17, he was 18, and the rest of it, the, uh, the women were, were all from university. They were all 21, 22, and it shows you the difference between a man and a woman and a 17-year-old and a 21-year-old. Okay. It was like a world of difference. I really was. So they went around the room and, you know, they asked people what do you want to be? Marketing director, HR director, buying director, managing director. They got to me, what do you and they said, What do you want to be, Philip? And I said, employed. They said, Pun. I said, employed. Everybody laughed. They really laughed. Um, everybody thought I was being super funny. Actually, I was telling the truth. I didn't even know what these titles were. Um, I suddenly realized how massively uneducated I was, not just in, in, in terms of um, um, academic, but in terms of life. You know, I didn't know what a buying director was. I had really no understanding. And I saw all these super intelligent people um, who really had clear vision about what they wanted to be at a very early age. And then it took me a period of time, and I think at the age of uh, 19, um, I'd really fallen in love with the product. I became an assistant manager, and at the age of 21, I became a buyer of our international department, which was buying Armani and Versace and Xenia and Canali. It was just amazing, and then I did casual wear afterwards. And at that point, I was offered a very big job uh, by Next when they just started menswear, living in Leicester. I lived in Leicester as a child, and I decided it wasn't right for me. And the guy I started with, he took the job. James, so James went to went off to the next, and I stayed where I was. And you know, at one point in our career, you know, he he circumvented me. You know, so I was still at, at Simpsons, and he, he shot up the ranks at Next. Um, and then uh, I went to um, the US the same time as he did. I went to Nautica, and he went to Ralph. Um, and then I, I basically I, I went to uh, Versace, and then he went to an Italian fabric company. And then literally, you know, it's like it's like life sliding doors, you know. And probably until that point, we were very similar sort of trajectories. Um, and then you know, the door slided the right way for me, and you know, my life changed, and um, I learned a lot. So at Versace, I worked for a guy called Mario Giraldi, and he had been the first ever non Zenya family CEO. And he was the most charismatic and visionary person I've ever come across in my life. Um, I learned so much from him about how to build brands and how you needed to, in effect, create this beautiful, not just aesthetic outside image of the brand, but all everything internally as well. You know, and I was a young kid. I was uh, in my early 30s and, and I was the managing director of, uh, of the UK, uh, m most of Europe, uh, emerging markets, Russia, Belarus, etc. Um, so I, I, I had uh, the biggest t territory uh, that there was. And I really learned for, from him. I, I, and, you know, it was a life-changing uh, period of time for me. Mm. Talk about that. What mm. what changed for you then? Well, you, you suddenly realise that, you know, I, I'd worked for basically family business. I worked for Simpsons. I worked for Dax. Uh, Nautica at that point was a family business. And then suddenly, and of course, Versace was a family business. But it, it, um, uh, there was a lot of um, influence from the Xenia family because they owned or partly owned a lot of the manufacturing elements. And, you know, um, this they looked at branding. The Italians look at branding in such a different way. You know, I came from Dax. So it was all about quality, um, uh, etc. It was all about being British heritage. And then you go to Versace, which was so um, uh, colourful and charismatic and visionary. It, it was it was it was amazing. I was, and, I, and I was a, you know, basically in my early thirties, and I learned so much. You know, mm -hmm. um, and I don't think you know how much you've learned until later on in life, and you look back. Mm -hmm. You know. Do you often look back now? I, I'm, I'm not very good at looking back. I, I never look back and say, could I, should I, would I? I really don't. Um, I don't reassess situations. Um, um, I enjoy it every day, and I try not to look at what happened yesterday. Hmm. I'm not good at all at spending time dwelling on things. Yeah, I think it's a personal waste. Life has been perfect sliding doors for you. So would you say you're a person that just sort of take things in a stride as opposed to 
coming up with sort of grand plans for your future and your career? I've never had grand plans, ever. Um, uh, things have just happened. Um, uh, talking about the Versace story, it's amazing. So um, Pam Bianco, they're the biggest luxury headhunters in the world at that time, uh, rang me and said, we, there's a perfect job for you, Philip. I said, fantastic. Who is it? Because in the old days when they wouldn't tell you who you were going to meet. So I met in a Duke's Hotel this most amazing 60-year-old guy with long hair, tanned, beautiful cashmere suit. He smelled amazing. I mean, I, you know, I fell in love with him. He was just amazing. And uh, at the end, we went out for dinner. Um, and, you know, I still didn't know what brand it was. I had no idea what brand it was. And then a week later, I got a call. You need to come to Milan. So we went to Milan. I was interviewed uh, in, in a hotel room, still not knowing what the brand was. Today, you'd look at it and go, were you stupid? <laughs> um, I never put this guy and Versace together. Not in a billion years. He, he was super elegant. Um, he, lo he looked like somebody that, who ran uh, Baroni or, or Kiton or, or Xenia. Da -da. Um, uh, and he was just so charismatic. And uh, I mean, a, a great story. And then I, I found out uh, that it was Versace. And you know, it wouldn't have been my perfect brand, I have to be honest with you. Um, but I, I fell in love so much with this, with this man and the team. Um, and I had amazing five years. I mean, just just a really amazing five years. I, I loved it. I travelled. Uh, we did some crazy things. And you know, uh, one of the, one of the best things was we we sat there on the uh, day, and they said, "Philip, we, we we love you. Write down on this piece of paper what you want." And I said, "Pardon." They said, "No, write down what what salary, pension, car. Write it down." So I wrote it down on a piece of paper, um, and the guy looked at it and he said. Go for a walk. I said, for how long? Yeah, we'll ring you at some point. So I walked around the Diomo, I think two or three times, got myself a cappuccino, which is not very Italian because I think it was past uh, one o'clock, and sat on the stairs and waited uh, for my Nokia to ring. Okay, um, And then the phone rang and uh, literally I got summoned back in and they said, yep, 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 yep. Uh, I, th I, don't, I, don't, I can't even remember if they changed anything. And then they just said, sign. And the Santo signed, and Mario Giorgio already signed. They gave it back to me and said, now find a lawyer to make it into a contract. And that was it. Um, and there were lots of other stories. And it was just a great time in, in my life. And it was, I, I learned a lot. I had fun. Um, and then, you know, at the end, you know, somebody said, why did you leave? And, and basically, it, it's a family business run by family. And... Um, uh, and I'm not Italian, and there's an inner circle, and it was difficult to get into that inner circle. I think really only John Aykroyd is the only person who's ever been able to get into the Versace inner circle. And um, you know, it, it's it's you know, too much. It was great, and then basically uh, the Moss Bros job came up, and I just thought, you know, this this is this is fun. This looks fun. Um, and the first bit wasn't fun. I think it was on week six that my uh, CFO walked in and said, Philip, we've run out of cash. And yeah, and again, uh, it shows you how immature you are sometimes. And you, and you sit there and go, "We can't run out of cash. We're a we're a public listed company." And he said, "Nope, we've run out of cash." And that was a real learning uh, for me. Another massive learning. It was a difficult time. We literally had to go back to every supplier and basically say, "We will pay you, but it probably won't be this week." And we every week we we said, "Right, who do we pay?" So it was it was a great learning curve for me. A very difficult different learning curve so not the emotion but how to run a business to make sure that you create financial success you know so it, it was great for me and uh um at the end, you know, uh, the, it was a, a collision of the titans in terms of uh, Philip Green and Kevin Stanford became quite complex. And, you know, I, uh, I came out of there at the right time and um, I didn't have a job at that time. So I, I literally left. Uh, I, I, I had a fantastic contract, which was, uh, uh, and I had a change of control contract, which was because Simon owned a big, uh, a manufacturing thing it created change of control which allowed me to uh, exit in a, in a very gentlemanly way for me and I went off to Italy to ski and um, I, I received a few phone calls uh, and within three weeks I had three very interesting offers and you know I still sit here today and somebody says why did you pick Hunkermuller 
And um, I tell a great story again where I was sitting in my car. I'd just flown back from uh, uh, from Amsterdam and uh, I'd never met a workers' council, to be honest with you. Um, you don't have them in the UK, but basically the workers' council um, have the final say if somebody is employed as a director. So... Um, it, uh, so I met these um, uh, uh, this team um, and then got back on a plane and flew back and then Tony Danuzzo rang me and said, Philip, is it a yes or a no? I said, yeah, Tony, I need to think about it. He said, no, no, Philip, we've just told 15 workers' council members. That they're predominantly shop, uh, shop uh, managers and that, and we've still got a current incumbent in the CEO's role. So you, yeah, you have to tell us ASAP. And uh, I remember at the time I ran, uh, you know, my mentor in life is Don McCarthy and I rang Don, couldn't get through to him. Uh, I rang uh, Keith Hamill, um, who'd been my chairman at Moss uh, Moss, couldn't get through to him. Uh, I rang my father, couldn't get through to him. Literally 15 minutes later, Tony Denuncia rings me and says, is it a yes or is it a no? And I said, it's a yes. I hadn't even spoken to Sarah at that point, so she didn't even know we were going to go and live in Amsterdam. So literally, that was a difficult conversation at night. Um, How did she take it? She, uh, extremely well. I mean, there were there were three different offers. One was in Italy, one was in New York, and one was and there was the Amsterdam one. And we we had sort of in our minds planned to, to go to New York. Um, and so when she came home, I said, "We're going to Amsterdam." So it was a it was a, it was a it, and you know we have had um, at both professionally and as a family, a great time. Being CEO, mm. you have a lot of responsibility. All eyes are on mm. you. You're under pressure to deliver. Mm. And many people question whether they even want to go down that route. Did you find it stressful, challenging? At the end of the day, um, you know, we've got 9,000 employees and there's one CEO. So it's a 9,000 and one, you know, who gets to the top. Um it's not for everybody, um, uh, and funnily enough, it, it was it was Simon Burwin said to me, um, Philip, um, it's very lonely being the CEO. Let me tell you that, and I kind of shrugged it off when he said it, um, but it's true. You know, basically, no one cares about you. They don't. Um, they care about themselves, and they want you you to look after them. They never want to look after you. You know, you get paid too much money, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very different thing. It's not a role for everybody. Um, I think a lot of people when they're young believe it, it, it should be it should be a role that they want. It has changed a lot. When I look back at my days um, and I look at bosses and I won't tell you which ones, on Friday afternoon they went off and played golf. Those sort of things just don't happen any longer. You know, the world has changed. Um, our responsibilities have grown far greater. So, you know, we have pressures on sustainability. We've just signed up for science-based targets. So we're now, we, you know, we, we've agreed that we will literally be assessed openly in the open public in, in Europe. Um, you know, we have a DNI pressures, um, which I truly believe in coming from the US and, and the UK and, you know, seeing the, the importance of having a, a truly diverse workforce um, uh, you, I know we get the best out of it, but there are so many different pressures. Previously, it was that you ran a business, and once you got to the top, you were nearly untouchable. Now that that has changed a lot, you uh, you have to deliver both on the financial, you have to deliver on a clearly defined strategy, you have to deliver on cash flow, but you also have to d deliver on really clearly defined sustainability targets, uh, DNI targets. So there are far more pressures on the. The, the new CEOs that will be coming to the table, you know, um, uh, the world has just changed. And um, I, I think there'll be things that CEOs, who things I do, probably other CEOs won't do. Um, but, you know, you, you have to be a chameleon and you have to be able to have an opinion on, on a bank debt, uh, on a product strategy, on a sustainability vision, and and a DNI target. So it is previously, you know, when I look back at my early days, the CEO basically, um, I mean, as you know, I think uh, I think the number is eighty percent of UK retail and CEOs come from B and M. Um, uh, you know, that's also going to change. You know, e-commerce becomes so important. Digital is, is a, a huge element. It's it's nearly forty percent of our our business is digital, both in terms of you know e-commerce, but click and click, click check and reserve, order in store, return to store, dispatch from store. Um, you know, the concentrations on three PLs to, to make sure the last mile is important. So the, the 
the, the whole pressure has changed a lot and it, you're, we're adding lots and not just for my role, but for every CEO's role, there are added pressures far greater than there were from, from our predecessors. And, you know, the people who take over for me, they will have far more pressures than I had. Mm. For CEOs of the future, what functions do you think that will come from? I, I, you know, I still think B&M is really important because basically at the end of the day, um, you know, there are a couple of key ingredients to successful business and really a branding a product. I mean, at the end of the day, if the product is not right, then there is nothing. So, you know, you can understand why a lot of them come from a B&M. If you look at it in difficult times, um, C, uh, CEOs come from CFOs because it's basically about making sure you have a solid person at the helm. But in times where you know, the, the world is moving forward. It, it probably needs to come from, still I think B&M is really the most important. And then it's close second would be marketing because it's about brand. It's about, you know, how do, how do we look to the consumer? And then basically digital, which is needs to be so embedded into every business, you know, in different shares. You know, for us, you know, our strategy is to get to 50-50. Uh, we still believe the importance of stores. You know, we had lots of reports done by Bain, BCG, etc. a few years ago, which said the girl gang is dead. So that Saturday morning, three girls going out, shopping, uh, having a coffee, shopping, and then having lunch, they said it's dead. It's not dead. It's so alive, it's unbelievable. Um, and so, you know, after COVID, there is a revival back into physical stores. We're seeing physical stores do it extremely well, and we're seeing a softening on, on digital. But, you know, I think, you know, digital in the future is, is going to be so embedded into the way we shop. So, you know. No, it needs to be part yeah. in every single function. You have it does, to make sure that you're... But you still, whoever leads the business has to have um, uh, a vision of what you look like, both in terms of product, marketing, uh, and basically the, 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 how you basically sell to the end consumer. And that, you know, that's got to be your strategy. You know, how, how do you want to be perceived? You know, for us, we really do want, everybody talks about the seamless journey, but we really, really think about it. We, we really look at the customer first. We created our customer's persona and she's called the Shiro. Okay. And it's based off the 18, late 1800s um, uh, word they used for all the women fighting for their voting rights. Okay, so when was uh, this? It was in the uh, depending on each country. It was around the nineteen hundreds where um, uh, they, they were fighting for. So their it's voting. an existing. It, it was existing, existing terminology. Mm -hmm. I thought my marketing director had created it. I really did. I. Uh, it wasn't until a, a little bit afterwards I, I suddenly realised that we'd copied it. But I'm, uh, we we stole it with pride, and you know we we literally our, our consumer is a shero, and we literally show them product before we buy it we show the marketing campaigns before we buy it so we really make sure that the customer is really at the heart of everything we do and then it's, and then what happened was our staff said no we're sheroes and we had a little bit of an internal debate um over this the marketing director said no 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 no, no the shero is the customer and then our hr director our, our, our chro Anna yaka said no no our, our, our people who work in our stores, they're sheroes. They also buy our product. They're also the same age profiling. Let's don't, you know, at the end of the day, let's be proud. They want to be called sheroes. And we, we still today call them sheroes, you know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think, you know, at the end of the day, it's about having a clearly defined consumer and having a clearly defined service proposition to make sure that you deliver beautiful product on time at the right price. Mm. What advice would you give to... B&M directors or any function who aspire to be a CEO? Yeah, I mean, I, I, yes, you don't get to become a CEO unless you work hard. Let, let, let's be clear yeah, at the end of the day. Um, when I look at B&M directors, for them to grow into CEOs, they need always to have more financial awareness. Okay, they, they understand the product, they understand segmentation, they understand all those bits, but it's only one element of success. So it is about looking at, um, you know, other elements. And you need, even though you have a CFO, you do need to have a financial understanding of what are the levers to drive a, a business. Same with a digital director. You know, he's great at driving digital, but he, equally he needs more brand and product awareness. So it is about looking at... Um, as all of us, none of us are a perfect circle. You know, we, we, if anybody says they are, 
I, I've never seen it. At the end of the day, we always are better at one thing than others. Okay, um, and then you so you you know somebody says to me, why do you surround yourself with all these great people? Because they're the, my weaknesses. So um, basically, surround yourself with people, but equally make sure that you know. You know about how important the financing is. You know how important the digital area is and have a, a better understanding of digital so you can understand and have a conversation with a digital director at their level. Yeah. What's the one thing that you are very good at? What's your biggest strength? Pushing. Okay. Uh, my slogan is, is keep pushing. Okay. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if that is the right thing for today's CEO. Okay, um, why not? Uh, uh, because I think you know it is. It's the world is changing. Um, how we how we work is changing. Everything is changing. I mean, we got to a lot of places by by literally pushing things, really, really pushing things. Um, and I think, you know, um, some brands get there naturally. They really do. And it doesn't mean that you're, you you can only get there by pushing, okay? Um, uh, we are still a retail brand. That's that, that you know, so we're, we're a retail brand. I'd love to be a brand, 100% a brand, only a brand. Um, uh, but equally, you know, we have to wake up every morning, we have to look at our sales results and say, have we delivered? Um, so, you know, it, it, I think, you know, going forward, the world will be different. CEOs will be different. Um, still, at the end of the day, the CEO will be ass assessed on the valuation of the business and the profit. Okay. That's never going to change uh, because share pr prices are based off it. Valuations are based off it. Um, you know, as I said, we, we've sold Hunkerville four times. Um, you know, you know, why have I I've been successful? Because we've always sold it for more money. And at the end of the day, it is about how do you pay down debt at the same time create value. So, you know, at the end of the day, it is about, you know, if I've got this much capex, how can I utilize that to give me my best uh, return on capital invested? Yeah. What is the hardest part about being a CEO? Uh, ooh, um you got to be careful about the hardest part. To be honest with you, um, if you don't do, if you don't enjoy the pressure, then don't do it. I, I love the pressure. I, I really love it. Um, there's there's a lot, and every period of time there's a different. You know, we sat there at pre-COVID, right? We just had our best year ever. You know, it was amazing. Everything was amazing, and then suddenly COVID hit, and for no fault of our own, we nearly went bankrupt. You know, we sat there, stores were closed, we had a thousand stores closed, no income, um, very little support from, from certain governments. And you, 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 you have that panic, like, you know, we've worked at that point, it was like 12 years to get this business in this amazing shape. And for no fault of our own, we could destroy everything. So at that point, it is about um, making sure that we, we created a team of people and I think we were lucky. And somebody said, why do you think Hunkerbella survived COVID so so well? And we're predominantly expats at the senior team. And where everybody worked from home, most of the people who work for me, they have an apartment. Okay, um, And uh, coming to work is basically probably the most fun part of the day. Um, so we made a decision as a senior management team through COVID, the first, even the first time, that we would be tested every single day, but we'd come to work. So we made decisions, not on teams, but sat there and really went through things and we made quick decisions and we got them instigated really quickly. It doesn't mean you couldn't have done this through teams. That's not, that's not what I'm trying to say. But actually we were, we lived together type thing. We went to lunch together. There was only 30 people in a building where there's normally 600 people. Um, uh, uh, so we all moved offices to be close to each other and, and we worked together as a team to get through this very critical period. So there are things that you have no control over. You know, um, you know, we're seeing a real downturn in the economy. Is it anything to do with with Hunkerville? No, it's not. It's just to do with the uh, the economy, and it is about making sure that you don't do stupid things. Now, um, like what? Well, I, I always uh, I I've got this thing where when when CEOs say we're going back to basics or we're going back to what we did when we were successful, then you know it's all over. 
then you know it's all over. Mm. Because there's a reason the brand moved on, because their old thing didn't work. So uh, uh, that always terrifi terrifies me. So when these things happen, I tend to always invest more money into marketing and try and push the product on even further. Um, I don't say that's right for every brand, but it's worked for us every time there's been a challenge. We've invested heavier and we've done braver things. So it's the bravery. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's belief. Be careful about bravery. Bravery can also be stupidity. Um, it, it's belief that this is, you know, um, you, you, we, you know, every single day in retail is difficult. I, and I don't think, um, you know, you do get those periods of time where it, where it just, it just flows, but they're, they're far less frequent than the times where we all wake up and, you know, the numbers don't look as green as we hope they would do. Mm. Yeah. You know? What does your team say about you when you're not there? Oh, my goodness me. I, 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 probably not very nice things. Um, um, uh, what they say about me? Um, they, 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 there's no question. They think I'm really tough. I mean, I, I, I had um, uh, one of these wonderful surveys done on me. And um, so the guy came back. And uh, I, I'm not very good at listening to, to um, good things. I have to be I'm much, I'm much more comfortable at listening to the, the tough stuff and he started telling me some of the good things my team said about me and I actually found it quite emotional and I told him to stop because actually it, 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 yeah, I found it very uncomfortable um, but the things that came out that were, that were poor was um, you make decisions Philip so quickly we never get the chance to debate them um, and sometimes that makes us lazy because basically you can work numbers out so fast uh, we, get, we get lazy and sometimes you have to give us a bit more breathing the other one was, you know, Philip, you get the numbers on a Sunday. You know every single number for 23 countries by the time we get to trading meeting. Um, and we just can't keep up. And things like, you know, you get off a plane from Hong Kong on a Monday morning at 5 o'clock and you come straight to the office. And we all have to go home. Um, and I said, but I've never asked anybody to come to the office. They said, no, but the pressure that you put on but you doing it yourself hurts us. Um, and you know, so some of these things were really, and and the, the coach said to me, Philip, try not to look at the at numbers on a Sunday. A coach, yeah, um, a mentor coach, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, a very expensive coach. I have to be honest with you. Um, and I, I, I learned a lot from him. He, 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 you know, he, he tried to get me to reflect. I, I reflected for about five minutes and then decided <laughs> it probably wasn't right for me. But I, I, you know, he said, look, don't look at the numbers on a, on a, on a Sunday. Go into a trading meeting on a Monday and let them basically make the decisions. Did you do it? I did it for about a month. I found it the most, I, I felt like I was drowning. That's the only way to say it. Somebody said to me, how did you feel? And I, I felt like I was drowning. Going in and not knowing something for me is not good. And I, again, and other CEOs are very comfortable with that, it's, you know, and, and allowing their team. For me, um, I need to be the car mechanic as well as the driver, okay? And I also don't think that's probably the right structure for, for the next generation of CEOs. So, mm. so it's not about saying this is the way you become a CEO. I find it easier when I know what's going on under the engine to make the decisions about how I drive the car. I wonder if your coach was thinking about how your one strength, you know, your mm. super on top of the mm. numbers, can also play, everything is pros and cons. Everything is, you know, everything that is a strength mm. has its opposite yeah. brother. Yeah. And to try to take a look of what the opposite might be like for you yeah. to be able to have more and Marie, options. That, that, and that's what, that's what he was trying to do. And he was just trying to create um, uh, a, a balance. Um, and, you know, at, at the end of the day, I have softened. I have become uh, less quick. Um, not not because I've become less quick, but because I'm trying to get the team to 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 move, and they they've been able to get there. I, and, I, and I'm super proud of them. Um, and you know, this you know, I'm now nine months through my year uh, uh, before I, I finish next year, 
and I can see the team really growing, and I'm super proud. I, mean, I really am, really, really proud. Um, uh, and maybe I should have done it earlier, and maybe they would have grown earlier. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, I, I'm, you know, what I leave is a beautiful brand with some super talented people who I really believe will take this business to the next level. Mm. Going back to that need to know the numbers and to be quick, mm. where is that coming from? It's not needing to be quick. It's just literally, um, I find it very easy to look at numbers and say this: this is what we need to do to to make to make these numbers better. Not just in terms of adding them up, but in terms of the the kind of trading decisions we need to make to be able to do things. Um, and it's you know uh, maybe in a previous life I was a market stall trader. I don't know, but I, I've just got that. I just enjoy. Um, uh, finding the solution and I see things quicker than than other people do um, it's not I'm not arrogant I mean I always got people that see it quickly but um, and then my coach said to me Philip you're making people lazy you're making people lazy because they know that you will come up with the answer so why, why, why take them time themselves? And now, as I'm leaving, I'm really starting to slow down. There's lots of uh, things I attend, I don't go to, and they're all doing well. They're all, you know, um, they you know, they all thought that they needed me, and actually, in the end, they're they're doing they're doing well themselves. Yeah. Mm. Looking back now, what advice would you give your 17 year old self in that meeting, being asked, "Well, what do you want?" You said, "Employed." No, but I, I think naivety is also sometimes a good thing. I think um, uh, you don't have to have a plan. Um, the only thing I, I, I say, uh, we have got we have 70 interns twice a year. We have a very structured intern program in, in uh, universities in Holland. You have to do one year of intern. And, you know, the advice I give everybody is only do a job you love. Simple as that. If you do not love it, Find another job, um, and um, you know, don't start being a buyer and then don't like it and go. Well, I've trained to be a buyer, so therefore I have to be a buyer. Go do something else, and you know, at the end of the day, we all work. You know, we work fifty years for the average man to have eleven years of retirement. Okay, let's put it into perspective, and um, so only do something you love, not something you like, something you love. And I don't see work as work. I, I, I have no issues any day getting up at five o'clock and going to the office. I really don't. I, I don't see it as work. I don't see when I'm sitting on my phone um, uh, answering calls at 10, 11 o'clock at night. I don't see it as work. Um, somebody said to me, but Philip, you work on holiday. It's not work. It's, it's, it's just part of my life. And if it's not part of your life, then you don't love it. Mm. Philip. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Such a pleasure to talk to you. Oh, always good to see you. <laughs> you always too. good to see you. Hopefully be quicker than, than five years. Like yes, it was please. awesome. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you. you very much indeed. Thank you. You've been listening to Anatomy of a Leader podcast. I'm your host, Maria Vorostovsky. If you haven't already, please follow and subscribe this podcast. And I'll see you in the next episode.